Hello and welcome. This is QTV News. I am Umudu Gajaga. Thank you for joining us. First, the main local, international and sports news headlines. We hear about the progress made on dialogue between stakeholders around the draft constitution following the second visit by Goodluck Jonathan, the former Nigerian president. We have an update on the suspects said to be on the run in connection with the recent massive cocaine seizure at the Banjul ports. Also, testimonies from two former NIA operatives about the torture carried out at the agency's headquarters and how one of them later became a torture victim. We also hear why lax enforcement of laws to protect marine life could have serious consequences. In international news, we take an in-depth look at what's really behind the rising tide of internet shutdowns across Africa. In sports news, we hear about a recently formed team which triumphed in the annual Dean Memorial Tournament. And also in international sports, the Ivory Coast International, popular with players and fans who is battling cancer. Those were the main news headlines. And now, the local news in detail. Welcome and thanks for joining us. This is QTV News. First, the Director of International IDEA for Africa and West Africa has revealed that negotiations on the draft constitution chaired by former Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan have made some progress despite some key contentious issues remaining unresolved. Babu Karsise has more. In September last year, National Assembly members voted to reject the draft bill seeking to give the country a new constitution. The second phase of the consultative dialogues chaired by the former Nigerian president, Goodluck Jonathan, to end the political deadlock on the draft constitution ended last week. Stakeholders and political parties met to broker a consensus on the contentious issues that divided all politicians. For the sake of clarity and transparency, the international idea assures Gambians that they have a clear conscience and are here for a genuine purpose and not to meddle in the affairs of our country. In coming to bring stakeholders together to walk through their areas of agreement and areas of disagreement in order to keep both the transitional commitment on a new constitution on track and arrive at an agreement on those areas of disagreement. Our whole purpose has been to be supportive and facilitative, not to come and write a constitution for the Gambia. We are not interested in that, and we have no desire for it, and we will never accept to come to do so. We can come and share experiences, we can come and share knowledge. Foreign interventions to create dialogue and end crisis in the Gambia is not a new thing. Nevertheless, some are still arguing that Gambia belongs to Gambians as such why the need for good luck Jonathan's intervention. We, we invited uh, with the consent of uh, His Excellency the, the President um, of the Republic of the Gambia, uh, President Adama Baru, um, who necessarily had to, had to agree uh, to um, such an invitation. We asked that an elder statesperson with experience but sufficient neutrality uh, from the context should help to facilitate some of the sessions of our conversation with the stakeholders. Uh, and the person who was uh, agreed upon, uh, as you already know, was President Goodluck Jonathan former president uh, of Nigeria, uh, whom all of the stakeholders uh, felt uh, had enough credibility and neutrality to be able to convene them. Important uh, to have such a person because what we are dealing with was not just a technical question, but a very political set of questions. Some of the hot arguments among other issues were entered on citizenship, presidential age limit, and residence requirement for citizens to contest the presidency. There were people who were adamant that citizenship by birth must be given to anybody born of any parentage. It doesn't have to be of Gambian parentage. As long as you are born in the Gambia, you should be entitled to citizenship. 
But there were people who told us they voted against only because that clause was not to their satisfaction. You take the matter of age limit, right? And there again, there were people who said, well, we don't want old people to rule us. We're a young country. And there were those who were saying, well, put age limit and we will never accept it. So a lot of discussions took place around this and in the end, an agreement was reached uh, not to have an upper limit. Also like residency requirement. Should it be one year to be resident, ordinarily resident in the Gambia, to be eligible to be president? Should it be three years? Should it be five years? The draft recommended three years. Some people said it was too much. Let it be only one year. But in the end, they also all came together and agreed and said, okay, let's try the three years. The general sentiment is that the Gambia needs a new constitution for the Thai Republic that promotes national unity and incorporates the values of our society. Also, there will be no competitive politics if there are no political differences. The big issue is when does the new constitution come into effect and does it apply to the transitional period? Civil debate, dialogue, negotiations are among the options for Gambians to achieve a positive compromise to get a new constitution as the framework is already in place. Babu Karsise, QTV News. The officials of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, supported by other security agents, are on the hunt for a man believed to be the owner of a container recently seized at the country's only seaport with a large quantity of cocaine. Babu Karsi has the rest of that story. The container, part of a shipment said to be from Ecuador, was supposed to be loaded with salt, but officers stationed at the ports confiscated bags of suspected cocaine mixed with the salt. The cocaine loaded in 118 bags weighed over two tons, according to weighing officers. Also, the analysis officers conducted a preliminary test with a drug test kit referred to as color test using salt and powder to identify the suspected cocaine. According to the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency spokesman, Usman Sediba, their findings suggest that the containers belong to one Banta Keita, holder of a French passport said to be a resident of Fajara M. Sexon in the Carnifin municipality. The suspected drug lord is at large and he is currently being hunted by the narcotic detectives. Sheriff, who was their local contract person, is presently in custody helping the officers with the investigation while the manhunt for Mr. Banta Kinta continue. And on that regard, we call on the support of the public and accordingly we'll try our best to share the picture so that those who have information about him can report this matter to law enforcement officers. The CISO is yet another confirmation that the Gambia, like other West African states, continue to be a storage and transit route for cocaine by international organized criminal groups. Unfortunately, this is not the first time that the Gambia has been used for smuggling drugs by international criminal cartels, ranging from the Bonto case in 2010, the Simon A. Madi and Sons case at the seaport six months ago, and now this. The public are anxious to know what happens to people involved in these dealings, a question I put to the Delic spokesperson. The drugs were seized, evidence was collected, they were arranged in court, and they were sentenced accordingly. If you understand the criminal justice system, you know that there is a limitation at every end. All what we do is arrest, gather our evidence, gather our fact, and take the matter to court. With regards to the case of Saiban, Madi, and Sons, all what I could recall from the information that I got, and the information was that, in fact, it was a panel that was set up. It was not only us. A panel was set up, a report was sent, and it went to the office of the president. This is not the only seizure of drug that happened recently, as the drug law enforcement officers earlier last month confiscated more than half a ton of Moroccan hashish, but the authorities are yet to share full details about the matter. According to the PRO, details surrounding the seizure will be shared to the public soon if they conclude their investigations. I think half a ton, but we will also cover a press conference on that matter. The reason why initially there was no press briefing, which I will just hint for the attention of everyone, is that there were serious leads that we were following, and it gained dividend. But 
um, some unnecessary publicity hindered that investigation, but we are still making lead. On the questions being asked about latest incident, the suspects could face multiple drug-related charges such as dealing, trafficking and even conspiracy. But this cannot be done until the officers conclude their investigation and submit the analytical report to the rightful authorities. In an unusual move, some of the country's political parties have issued statements expressing concern about this latest seizure. From comments on social media and elsewhere, it is clear that the public is watching to see if anything will come out of this latest seizure. Babu Karsi, QTV News. A senior member of the National Intelligence Agency on Tuesday told the commission that ex-president Jame gave orders for them to torture people. Babu Karsi again. Samba Gajaga, who has been working at the NIA for many decades, acknowledges that human rights violations were the order of their operations, while quickly accepting that he was present in some of the torture sessions. The witness told the TRRC that he was a police officer in 1982, where he served for five years before being transferred to the National Security Service, which was later renamed the NIA after the 1994 coup. With vast experience in the operation of the NIA from the First Republic to the current government, the witness said he served in different units at the NIA and recalled how torture sessions were done and gave an example of the seven alleged rebels from Senegal who were arrested and taken to the NIA for interrogation before being tortured. They were interrogated. Uh, they were interrogated. To get something very clear from them. They were beaten mercilessly. They were beaten. Is it correct to say they were tortured? That's true. How were they tortured? They were beaten. How were they beaten? Tell this commission. I lived. They were beaten with uh, uh, whips. On what part of their bodies? You know, the one that does the beating does not choose what part of the body to beat on. When you are beaten with anger, you just sit. Gajaga said in those days, whenever they established a panel to investigate people, the former president, Yaya Jame, used to send people from State House to join the panel, and those people will be feeding him with information. On a daily basis, there was nothing that was hidden, hidden from him uh, as uh, as far as what was happening within the panel, and that was on a daily basis. And they would be there for him. The witness, who is still serving the NIA, said in 2013 he was appointed the acting director general of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, and after eight months he was redeployed to the NIA, where he still operates as a senior NIA now SIS operative. Babu Karsi, QTV News. We'll now take a short break and still to come, we have local, international and sports news. Welcome back and this is QTV News. Marine littering is increasingly becoming an environmental issue at the Tanji Fish Landing Site, one of the busiest commercial centers for fish products in the Gambia. The landing site has generated a significant amount of waste that poses a potential serious threat to marine life. QTV's Mohamed Lamin Choi has the rest of that story. The Tanja Fish Landing Site is turning into a source of pollution for marine life, one of the major sources of income for the same people who are the major cause of this harsh-looking scene of a potential environmental hazard. One that is covered with this large amount of waste, composed of plastic and other dangerous solid waste that were dumped as litter and are now afloat or lying on the shore. The effect of plastic in the, in the sea in, or in, in the water bodies is very serious because... This thing takes a long time before it degenerates. And even if it degenerates, it, de it degenerates into tiny particles that may even be difficult to see. And 
These things are mistaken by fishes for food and they are being ingested. And you know what that means. The unsightly condition of this public place has existed for many years without sustainable solutions with the full knowledge of the authorities responsible. They describe it as unacceptable, worrying and detrimental to modern and human lives, accusing the businessmen and women on the side of being the cause of the condition of this public space. It's our core responsibility. We are open uh, to any uh, lessons. Uh, we will take uh, a proactive lead role, ensuring that we bring all the stakeholders on board to ensure that uh, we uh, clear the, the rubbish and also perhaps sustainable measures to ensure that it, this do not happen again. Because when it happens, you know, cattle apply to common resources, that resources would have been used in other areas. In other, in other a few weeks previously and last Sunday, the Birkham Area Council collaborated with stakeholders and civil society organizations for a cleanup of the landing site. But this has proven to be an unsustainable waste management strategy due to the irregular and low public turnout for the major cleanup that is required. Those that have torn up can only clear a little of the large amount of waste that is getting into the ozone and covering the sea. Part of the cause of the growing waste at the fish landing site is the failure of authorities to effectively perform their complementary roles and functions. An accusation that can be leveled at several sectors in the country. Uh, the enforcement of the anti regulation also comes into play. All of us you know, have a responsibility. Uh, this is a multi dimension of all of us have a responsibility. Uh, the NEA, the council, and everyone, and the committee here. And on the subjects, you know, at the level of the past, we have a responsibility to take ownership of matters in relation to the environment. Sellers and traders are legally obliged to keep area of business free of litter according to the anti-littering regulations of the Gambia, which the NEA is responsible for enforcing. It is a punishable offence for sellers and traders to litter or deposit waste on any part of a business place, and those caught by the law can be fined between $1,000 to $5,000 dollars. Effective enforcement of this law could greatly help to maintain an orderly public behaviour towards our environment. It appears that inadequate enforcement of the anti littering regulations are being taken for granted by many Gambians. Even if you go on the ground, you tell them. So, so you may see people who were uh, taken to uh, court by NEA for breaking one or two rules, or, uh, uh, and they're in Tangier or any other fish landing point along the coast. Yeah, you would see a person who breaks a law, anti littering law. She or he goes to court, and the next time also you, you go out, you find the same person there. The NES regional director in the West Coast region tells QTV about the consultation with stakeholders and other efforts his directorate has taken to address the environmental concern at the Tanja Fish Landing site, but is without any sustainable solution to the increasingly developing waste at the landing site. Much of this waste contains plastic debris, and it is part of the 8 million metric tons that we dump into the oceans each year. And experts have warned that this might outweigh the number of fish in our ocean in the next 28 years. What is most starkly shocking is that plastic waste alone kills at least 100 million marine animals. Unless we, the problem, become the solution to this we will continue to suffer the consequences of our depleting water resources. Mahmoud Lamin, Choi QTV News. An NIA operative, Keba Seka on Wednesday, told the TRRC that the NIA was a torture center and that the mindsets of the NIA operatives at the time was to serve the interests of former president Yahya Jame before anything else. Omar Pijalo reports. The witness began his testimony with his educational background before telling the commission that he joined the NIA in 1998 after three months training and was then deployed to the political department of the NIA, going on to serve in different parts of the country, including Kemoto in Kiang, Fatoto, Birkama, Mandinaba, Jiboro and the tourism development areas before being arrested on the 25th of May 2007. Keba Seka said torture was a norm at the NIA headquarters and people were usually unlawfully arrested and detained for over 72 hours without being allowed a lawyer or brought before a court of law. He even mentioned one individual being detained for nine years without being brought before any court. 
Seka added that operatives of the political department of the NIA would usually attend rallies and meetings of opposition political parties, record and transcribe the meetings, and then send the information to their management, who would then send it to the former president. And where would the management send this report to? The management will send the report to the executive. And when you say executive, who do you, what do you mean? You know the uh, NIA is directly under the president's office, so we are answerable to the president. The witness told the commission that he was illegally arrested, detained at the Bakao police station for three days, and then later moved to the NIA headquarters, where he was stripped naked, handcuffed, tortured mercilessly, and detained for 45 days at a cell called Day and Night, alongside Lamin Starbaji and Duta Kamaso, a former National Assembly member and saving orders. Because one of the rebels was arrested with a motorcycle. And he said that particular motorcycle, I registered it at Bikama police station. I look at Babukar, I'm disappointed. I thought you would have made your findings before calling me. After 45 days at the NIA, he was taken to the Mile 2 Central Prison with Sam Kambai, Kemo Kante and some customers rebels where they were locked up at the special security wing cell number no. 5 for two years before being taken to the Birkama Magistrate Court where he was charged with one count of terrorism before his case was transferred to the High Court in Banjul. Kemo was a Rasta man. And he said they barb his hair with uh, bottles. They smash bottle and barb his hair before they torture him. And he was also a fiat colored guy. You can, uh, the torture scars are very visible. How about his head? Yeah, he sustained some injuries there. The witness also confirmed that the April 16 UDP demonstrators were seriously tortured by operatives of the NIA. He said he knew about their torture when they were brought before an investigative panel which he was a part of. Did you come to know the individuals that tortured them? Yes. Well, plus the names of these operatives that carried out the torture. Tamba Mansaring. Tamba Mansaring. And Bukar Sila. And Bukar Sala. Sila. Bukar Sala. Mm -hmm. Seka said after being granted a bail at the High Court, he was dismissed from the service but was later reinstated in 2013 and posted to the operations unit and then to the investigative unit of the NIA in 2014. Reporting for QTV News, I am Omar P. Jallo. In international news, cases of internet shutdown in Africa have been rising according to digital rights advocate groups. Governments justify shutdowns by citing public order, but some analysts and opposition figures consider this as an excuse for suppressing groups critical of the government. Here is Mamoudou Mboj's investigation. Uganda is the latest country to restrict access to social media platforms in the run-up to Thursday's presidential election. A similar shutdown was also imposed for their 2016 election. It has become a trend, according to some analysts, for governments to block the internet before, during and after elections. Between 2015 and 2018, one-third of all national elections were accompanied by an internet shutdown, according to one report, which also found a correlation between shutdowns and high levels of voting irregularities and electoral violence. And authoritarian regimes are the worst offenders of social media shutdowns to stifle public debate, social action, and dissent. A 2019 research paper showed that out of the 22 countries that had disrupted access to the internet in Africa, 17 were authoritarian. This string of shutdowns demonstrates the ongoing ambivalence that many African governments have with regard to the internet, according to one report, explaining that, on the one hand, they are aware of the internet's benefits for economic development, but on the other hand, they fear internet-enabled social mobilization and challenges to poor governance. A case in point is Sudan, 
who imposed a shutdown mere months after hosting the 2018 African Internet Governance Forum on the theme Development of the Digital Economy and Emerging Technologies in Africa. Ethiopia imposed an internet shutdown which lasted for close to a month in response to unrest which followed the killing of a prominent Oromo singer and activist, Hachalu Hondasa. Zimbabwe, Togo, Burundi, Chad, Mali and Guinea and many other countries have at one point or another imposed shutdowns. Autocratic states such as Russia and Iran are mapping what is called sovereign internets that can be cut off from the outside world whenever a ruler chooses or walled off altogether, as in the case of China's Great Firewall. Some experts fear that this might catch on in Africa. Putting aside human rights issues, such internet blackouts wreak havoc on businesses, medical services and education, analysts have warned. One report highlighting that sub-Saharan Africa lost up to $237 million to internet shutdowns since 2015. The Internet Society has also noted that the use of traffic hijacking to block platforms at the national level has even led to global unavailability of a service. However, some experts have pointed out that government-led shutdowns are simply symptomatic of a wider weaponization of information where individuals, groups and institutions try to control information flow for insidious ends. This information, or as President Trump popularized it, fake news, has spread rapidly across the globe as a tool used even or perhaps especially by governments to influence, if not control, public opinion. Trump used his Twitter as the de facto mouthpiece for the U.S. executive, spreading what many have described as fake news. More recently, he used it to incite the mob invasion of Capitol Hill for his sins Twitter and other social media companies suspended his account in what has been described as a big tech purge of the online platforms used by Trump and his supporters. The dream of a democratic electronic babel tech companies once promised would empower ordinary people has had a wake-up call from the reality of what people actually do. The technology is a double-edged sword. The Arab Spring arguably revealed the extent of the web's revolutionary potential, but what has given it such potential has also become a priceless tool in propagandists' hands. For QTV News, I am Mamadou Mbouch. And now to sports news. The Dean Testimonial Football Tournament ended over the weekend with debutant team Laka Baro, owned by Gambian international Musa Baro of Bologna, emerging victorious, beating Team Visa 1-0 at the Brikama Mini Stadium in Brikama. Babu Karsi was there and he files in this report. This is the sixth edition of the Dean's Testimonial Football Tournament, traditionally played in December when our professionals fly back home during the Christmas break. For the first time, Musa Baro of Bologna formed a team from his neighborhood in Canifin Estate to compete against opponents like Team Steve Trawale. And with the inclusion of Combo East last year's surprise package of the Zonal Championship. For the first time, the tournament was taken to the West Coast region in Brikama and their first division team was invited to participate but failed to make it to the final. In the final, a lone goal was all Team Lakabaro needed to be crowned champions. That goal separated both sides right at the end, despite Team Visa creating some decent chances. Surprisingly, Team Visa is coached by a National Assembly member, Honorable Abdullah Sise, who attributes the loss to a number of key players being missing from the squad. We were prepared very well. Um, in the morning, we had the boys, we called them, and then everybody was, was intact, was fully prepared. Uh, the only, the only loss we have is most of the players who we are playing in the team, I mean, they are, they are denied to play in this final because they are first division clubs and second division teams do not allow them to play. We had to bring in, I mean, young ones to, to occupy the, the, the space for them. His opponent, Bajsamba Sise of Team Lakabaro, said winning the trophy means a lot to the team and to him in particular as a young coach. We prepared so well for the final to come and clinch the trophy for the first time that we joined this testimonial tournament and the first time we won it. That was going to be my question. This is the first time Laka Baro is joining the team. I mean, when we say Laka, we mean Musa Baro. Um, how did he support the team uh, coming into this tournament? Yeah, he supports the team both financially 
Yeah, I can say 100%. In spite of the move to January from its traditional December date, the tournament organizer Alajidin said this is the best year of the event since its inception. Brikama is a home of football. Now they love football. Uh, for the past three, four years, they have been calling me to bring the tournament to Brikama. So this time around, we just take this, take our decision to bring it to. Do organ I do organize this uh, tournament for a, a charity game because if you could say go on YouTube, we normally do our presentation at the uh, uh, at the one boarding uh, boarding school in Sifo, yeah, Islamic boarding school in Sifo for uh, it's an camp. So we normally take some some goods there like some like sugar bag of rice milk and so on and so on so still now we go, we, we we enter that still now we enter that and probably um, by next month on the 15 we're going to uh, sifo the victory for team lakabaro by players from his neighborhood adds another accolade and joy to the bologna superstar who was recently named player of the year for his italian side babo karsi qtv news and now to another sports news, but this time a sad one. Ivory Coast International and Cardiff City defender Suleiman Bamba is being treated for cancer. The championship club has announced the 35-year-old has been diagnosed with non-Hawkins lipomia and undergoing chemotherapy. More in this report. The club said in a statement, Saul has begun his battle in typically positive spirits, will continue to be an integral part of the Bluebirds family. The National Health Service, NHS, Wales described the illness as a type of cancer that developed in the lithomatic system, a network of vessels and glands spread throughout your body. The lithomatic system is part of your immune system. Bamba, whose first name is Suleiman, but who is universally known as Saul, joined Cardiff in October 2016 under former coach Neil Warnock. The Bluebirds said Bamba is universally admired by teammates, staff and supporters in the Wales capital. The club's statement added, during treatment, Saul will support his teammates at matches and younger players within the academy, with whom he will continue his coaching development. While we request privacy for him and his family at this time, messages of support to be passed on Saul through our email service. We are all with you, Saul. Saul Bamba helped Cardiff City win promotion to the Premier League in 2018 and has made more than 100 appearances for the club before their relegation to the Championship in 2019. The former Paris Saint-Germain player is said to be a hugely popular member of the squad, though this season he has been restricted to just five Championship substitute appearances and one League Cup start. Bamba is also a much-travelled player who has spells at Don Farmline and Hibernian in Scotland, Leicester City, Leeds United in England, Trabzon Sport in Turkey, and Italian club Palermo during his career. His travels enable him to become fluent in French, English, Italian, Turkish, as well as his father's Boale from Ivory Coast. His compatriot Yaya Toure, his supporters and former clubs have taken to social media to wish the defender a quick recovery. Yaya Ture posted on Twitter, thinking of you Sol Bamba and sending you all my strength. Sol Bamba brought so much joy and excitement to our family for a couple of weeks back in February 2019. So sad to hear the news tonight and praying for your full recovery, Phil Bosby posted. Bamba was born in France but plays his international football for the Ivory Coast, featuring 46 times for the Elephants including World Cup appearances, and was part of their Africa Cup of Nations squad when they were runners-up in 2012 and played his last match for them in 2014. We joined the football family in wishing him a full and speedy recovery. Before we end this bulletin of the news, let's have a quick look at our main news stories. First, we brought you an update on the progress made on dialogue between stakeholders around the draft constitution following the second visit by Goodluck Jonathan, the former Nigerian president. We also had an update on the suspect said to be on the run in connection with the recent massive cocaine seizure at the Banjul ports. Also, testimonies are from two former NIA operatives of the torture carried out at the agency headquarters and how one of them later became a torture victim himself. We had, while Lux 
enforcement of laws to protect marine life could also have serious consequences. In international news, we also took an in-depth look at what's really behind the rising tide of internet shutdowns across the continent of Africa. In sports news, we had how a recently formed team triumph in the Dean annual memorial football tournament. And also about a story concerning Ivory Coast former international Suleiman Bamba, who is battling cancer. And he was known to be a player favorite and also a favorite of the fans, especially at his team, Cardiff City. With that, we say thank you very much for watching this broadcast, but don't forget to join us at 10 for another bulletin.